Well, good morning again and welcome. Glad you are here with us this morning. Let me reinforce and reiterate two things that Pastor Jared had said in the beginning here of our time. For our family gatherings that we're endeavoring to have through the month of August, this is, this is an effort to help us, if, if you r- recall from, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago, where I said we, we're, we're a friendly church, but we want to be friends, so we want to move from being friendly to being friends. This is an opportunity to do that, and our hope is that we would get about 20 different families or people that would open up their homes and say, I'll host. If we can get 20, that means everybody only has to host once. So over the month of August, we'll have four or five gatherings on each Sunday, and they'll be in four or five different locations every Sunday so that we can kind of move around and hang out with a different group of people, and the burden on the host isn't that much other than one gathering. So if you would consider that, we would greatly appreciate it. And it's not much that we're asking, you know, open up your home. If you have any special needs, you can let Pastor Jared know that. It won't be a surprise because we're going to have sign-up sheets. You'll know who's coming, how many people, so you can be prepared. And then secondly, about our uh, Sunday at the lake at the end of the month, we really are encouraging and asking you to be a part of the service and to bring somebody with you. We really feel like this is going to be a special day. We have never had the service at the lake, if, if you've been around. Uh, we, the last Sunday of July, we have service here, and then we all run down there to the lake, which is like seven minutes away, and we hurry up and change, and we do baptisms in the lake, which is beautiful, and then we enjoy lunch in the afternoon together. But since it's a fifth Sunday, we thought, well, let's just move the whole thing there. So we're going to have our service at 1030, just one service like we would on a fifth Sunday, but we're trying to make it more of an event as well. So we have some planned activities for those that are interested. We're going to bring some stuff out for the kids. Um, we, we have some other surprises that will happen throughout the afternoon, but really try to make it more of an event that we can really bring people to, get, a, get some experience with the people of your church and my church and just hanging out and enjoying a meal together. So it's very important, though, if you could RSVP because we're providing the food, um, the main course, it'd be good to know so we don't run short. If you could do that, just go to the Gate Church, go to our website, right on our homepage is a link to the picnic page, and it's all there. And if you're interested in baptism, let me know that. You can do that through the same page or reach out to me, and we'll have a conversation, and, uh, and we'll take care of that as well on that Sunday. So I'm looking forward to it. Pray for good weather, and, uh, and, that, and that we can worship together in that beautiful place. Today, we move to Psalm 63. This, this psalm, um, I think they've all been very special, but this one is one of the most well-loved psalms that we'll read. John uh, Chrysostom wrote back in the fourth century that it was decreed and ordained by the primitive church fathers that no day should pass without the public singing of this psalm. He later said that the spirit and the soul of the whole book of Psalms is contracted into this psalm, Psalm 63. The ancient church actually had the practice every time they would gather that they would start their time together by singing this hymn, this psalm, and they called it the morning hymn. So when they would corporately gather as a body, they would start by singing Psalm 63 together. It's a psalm that David writes from the wilderness. Now, David is not on a day hike. He's not camping He's running for his life. He's running from his son, Absalom. It's believed that this is the time when his son was revolting against him and had, uh, had gotten some people to join him and they were chasing him. David was on the run. And he writes this beautiful psalm from the wilderness, knowing that his enemies were pursuing him. So let me read you Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. 
but those plotting to destroy me will come to ruin. They will go down into the depths of the earth. They will die by the sword and become the food of jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear to tell the truth will praise him while liars will be silenced. Let's pray again. Father, we thank you again for this time and this place that we can gather. Pray that your word is spoken, Lord, and that we hear from you what you have for each of us. Not only do we hear it, Lord, but we embrace it and we allow it to change us as only your word can. So may we be faithful to you. And we thank you, Lord, more than we can express for your love and for Jesus who came out of that love to die in our place. It's in his name that I pray, amen. So David finds himself literally in the wilderness and he starts this hymn, Oh God, you are my God, which tells us something about the relationship that David has with God. Because he says, oh God, you are my God, right? Two times in the first phrase of this hymn, of this poem, of this song, he says, oh God, he identifies God, Elohim. That's the word that we have translated to, oh God. That that God, Elohim, the God, the creator of the universe, our heavenly father, is my God. He makes this very personal. It's easy for us to go through life and just believe that we're one of the masses and we kind of get lost in the crowd and God is dealing with bigger things and, 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 and issues and people and we just kind of hide in the crowd. But if we're gonna get this relationship right with God, we take it personal. It's between me and him, it's between you and him and we share that relationship, but it's personal and something is gonna lead our lives. Something is gonna be our God. For David, it was Elohim. Oh God, he declares, you are my God. If we had to fill in that blank for ourselves, if this was our song, if this was our hymn, if this was our poem, could we say the same thing? That God, the creator, our heavenly father, is our God. The one that we submit to. The ultimate authority in our lives. Because this is what David does and has done. And notice in his life, he had some great victories. He was found faithful in some great things, but he had some big failures as well. And his resume is not spotless. We just went through his psalms of confession and, 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 and remorse and grief that his sin had caused him in one situation with Bathsheba and having her son Uriah killed and, and all that came with that. But he's also David, the boy who killed Goliath. So his resume goes from the highest of the peaks to the lowest of the valleys. And even there, he declares that God is his God. And he says, I earnestly search for you. Closer to the original, it's, it's early I search for you. Like I, I begin my day seeking you. Why? Because God's hiding from us? No, because we don't look for him. God is ever present. He's at work all around us. His word is clear about this. We're spiritually blind to him. God is revealing himself to us, not hiding from us. So David's cry at the beginning of this hymn is that he's telling God who he is, that you are my God. You are the authority in my life. And I seek you. I want to know you. I want to know what you have for me. I trust you more than I trust me. I put my faith in you, so I seek you. He says, my soul thirsts for you, my whole body longs for you. He's in a desert. He's in the wilderness, in a dry and parched land, he says. And he doesn't say that uh, my body thirsts for water and hungers for food. He says, my soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs, all of my physical being, all of my spiritual being desires you first. This was David's posture with God. Understanding that God is the one that draws us to himself. We are all here right now, every one of us, because of God's prompting in our lives to to get us here. Our human nature would be to reject God. That's what we do by nature. We reject him. 
We don't want to do what he wants us to do. We don't want to follow his ways. We don't want to give up authority of our life. But he stirs our dead souls and we start to question our life, our existence, the reality of our existence, death. And we can choose to accept the truth of his son or we can reject it. But he started the whole process. Dead people don't know they're dead. He stirs our souls. David says, I'm searching for you. My soul longs for you. My body, my, my body longs for you. My soul thirsts for you, God. This is who you are. This is how much I need you. But sometimes we only go to God. Some of us are in a pattern where we only go to God when we need help. And we view God as some cosmic Santa Claus up in the sky and we go, here's my list and I've been good. So you got to deliver the goods for me here. But how often do you or I get a phone call and we look at the caller ID and we go, not answering it. Because we know the person calling, they only call when they need something. They need to borrow something. They're short a couple dollars. They got to get a ride. And we go, I I don't want to have this conversation right now. Because every time they call me, they just want me to do something for them. And we don't like it. And yet often we find ourselves doing that with God. We only go to him when we're asking him to deliver something for us, to do something, to fix something, to make something happen. David is in the desert running from his enemy and his soul and his body are longing for God. Do we seek and search God at that level? Do we have this desire for him? David's we'll see through this psalm and many of his psalms that he has a great need for God, the same need that you and I have. He acknowledges it and depends on God. But when do we seek him? When do we really start searching him out, asking him to reveal himself? David, in 1 Samuel, it's written that David had a heart like God. He was a man after God's own heart. That's what it says. And yet his life was up and down like yours and I's. And what gave him that heart that God would say, he desires me, is that he understood his position, who he was, even as king, that God was greater and that he needed God more than God needed him. The truth is God desires us. He wants us, but he doesn't need us. None of us participated in creation None of us participated in the parting of the Red Sea, the great miracles of God. None of us had a, he he can do everything by himself. He chooses to have a relationship with us. He wants a relationship with us. But our posture needs to be one like David's. We need him. We need God. He says, I've seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. He says, I search for you in verse one. I want to see you. I need you to review us. I'm looking for you. Uncover my blind eyes so I don't miss your presence, your work around me. And this should be our prayer, that we don't miss it, that God would open our eyes. He says, but I have seen you. I've seen you in your sanctuary. But he's not in the sanctuary anymore. David's in the wilderness being pursued by his enemy. But he says, I know who you are because you've revealed yourself to me in the past. I trust you. I know you. He says, I've gazed upon your power and your glory. I remember what you've done. I recognize your work. In Matthew chapter seven, Jesus tells us, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. If we say God's not here, wherever here is for us, and oftentimes it's in those desert wilderness experiences because we believe we're in that place because God has left us. He's abandoned us. But David shows us that we can worship in the wilderness. That even in those low spots where we find ourselves, that God is there. We just need to cry out to him to reveal himself. That God is the one that's at work. He's faithful. He began the work. He'll be faithful to complete it. 
And we, many of us, have been saved. And we trust God for our salvation. But that's where the relationship stops. We see God as sending us a savior. And then we believe the relationship will pick up on the other side of eternity. And between now and then, we just try to live a good life. But God is sanctifying us. He has a plan and a purpose for each of us. He has way more plan than you or I could imagine. And he wants us to acknowledge him and to seek him because he will reveal himself. See, we can know God and we can even love what God has done and not actually love him. We can love the benefits of the relationship with God without loving the person. David loved God, the person. He understood the relationship. He says, because in verse three, your unfailing love is better than life itself, how I praise you. That God's love is greater than life. We fight to preserve our lives. We do all kinds of things to keep our health. We, we, we fight to preserve the lives of others that we care for. It's probably the most valuable thing we have is our life and the life of those we love and care for. And he says to God, your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. And the word translates as kneel or, or bless. And the praise is not a worship style of music, but it's a way of life that we live within God's love and we praise him for it, that he desires us, that we can come together corporately and sing together his praises, but that every minute of every day is focused on seeking God in the ordinary and the normal. What does God have me here for? What does he want me to do with what I have, the situation I'm presented with? David says, your unfailing love is better than life itself, not in the land of plenty, not in the green pastures of Psalm 23, not in the land of milk and honey, the promised land. He says this from the wilderness because David recognized some things about God's love and they changed him. And that same love that God had for David, he has for us. David knew that he... God's love for him was not dependent on his circumstances. That David could be king, and oftentimes when we feel like we're at the top of the, of the mountain, we're at the peak, things are good, that we are close to God. And we know what happens in life, and we find ourselves in the valley, and then we go, it's his fault. He did this. He's not fixing it. He's not answering my prayers. He doesn't care about me. Whatever it is. And we start to detach and push back. But David understood that his circumstances didn't determine God's love for him. Here he is in the wilderness and he still says, your unfailing love is better than life itself. And his life is on the line. In Romans chapter eight, verse 35, Paul writes, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Why does Paul ask that question? Because we question God's love when we have trouble and calamity and are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death. He says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, Neither angels nor demons, neither fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. David knew his security was in God because God loved him. And I think we struggle with understanding God's love because our perception of love is what we experience between each other. And love 
Love is not, that we share with each other is not like God's. We love people who love us back. We don't love people who don't love us. Our love is conditional. Our love does have limits. So when we hear something like this, we go, I don't, I don't get it. I don't think that could be real. But David embraced the truth. Paul understood this. Right? David had all kinds of peaks and valleys in his life. Paul was a persecutor of Christians. He had them arrested. They were beaten, tortured, killed. Meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. Puts his faith in Christ. And then starts doing the work that God called him to do. And he says, I'm convinced that there's nothing that can separate from, from God's love. And he's a guy that you could say, yeah, your life should probably be separated from God's love. You actively were working against him. He understood what it meant to be loved unconditionally. That God would show up, intersect his life, and say, no, I got a plan and a purpose for you. I don't think any of us have done what Paul did while he was Saul. So we don't have any excuse. He writes in Ephesians chapter three, he said, you, uh, you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully. Then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Paul knew, right, that, that, that God's love was unlimited, that it had no boundaries. He says, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. Our love has boundaries. God's does not. He says, God's love is incomprehensible. You're gonna try to understand it, just stop trying. It's beyond what we can comprehend. He says, it's too great to understand. Just accept it. Don't try to dissect it and understand it. Just embrace it. And without it, you're incomplete. You'll always feel like there's something missing. And you will search for whatever it is you think is gonna fill that void that only God's love can. He says, you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. This is what God's love does for us. It shows us what love is. It shows us what God can do through us and with us, not because he needs to, but because he wants to, because he desires the relationship and he paid a high price for it. In Romans chapter five, Paul writes, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. God didn't say, here's the plan. If you people could just get cleaned up here a little bit, make some progress, I'll help you. He didn't. When we deserve the worst, he gave us his best. This is what sacrificial love looks like. His love for us is undeserved. We don't deserve it. Paul understood that. David understood that. They embraced it. That it, was, it wasn't about them. That God loved them for who they were, but too much to leave them there. And that truth is the same for you and for me. He says, I'll praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. This idea that praise is something we do, yeah, but it's really more of who we are. That we live a life of praise. That we seek God in everything. We seek him first. And he says, I lift my hands up to you in prayer. This is a biblical expression of worship. It's a sign of surrender. That God, I give it to you. I don't deserve you. I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve you to interact with me, to save me, to send your son to die for me, to give me a plan and a purpose to include me in your work. I don't deserve any of it. I, I can only surrender to you. Paul writes in Romans 12, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship that the way you live, you are considering, you're seeking, you're searching God. You've seen him work, you're searching him. And now you surrender to him. Whatever it is he's asking you to do, you do. Because you are the beneficiary of undeserved, unlimited love. 
so we must surrender. He writes in Galatians chapter 2, I've been crucified with Christ. Paul was not physically crucified at this point. But to him, who he was is dead, gone. He writes about us being a new creature, that we've been born again. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Right? This isn't Paul leading Paul's life anymore. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Everything we do should be an act of worship at work, at home, with family, with friends, wherever. If we just consider, if we, if we are actively considering why God has us where he has us in the moment, he's got to work. He's got a plan. We just ask him to reveal it. Show me, God, what you want me to do here. Not just at the mountaintops, not just when we're at the place of victory, but, but also in the valleys. God, what do you want me to do here? How do you want to use me for your greater work? He says, you satisfy me. This is why we surrender. This is why we seek God, because he satisfies us. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. We're talking to a king. His menu, we would, we would have no idea some of the stuff he had and probably will never experience it. So when he says richest feast, he's talking about richest feast. But he says, God, you satisfy me more than that. That the things of this world cannot do what only you can. That's to fill that void in my soul. And I will chase and we chase other things to fill that void and they fall short every time. He said, my soul thirsts for you, but my soul will be satisfied by you. So I seek you, I surrender to you, I sing to you, I'm satisfied by you. You are all we need. God, you're it. If I have nothing else, I just need you. David understood this. He lived this. Jesus in John chapter six says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. In John chapter four, just two chapters earlier, he says, everyone who drinks the water, this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. See, he gives us these pictures because we understand what it's like to be physically hungry and physically thirsty. But if we think about and consider the deepest cravings of our soul, it's hungry and thirsty. And only Jesus will satisfy that hunger and thirst. Jesus says, I'm not just gonna give you water to quench your thirst for the moment. I'm gonna give you the source of water. You'll never be thirsty again. You'll never thirst again. You will be satisfied. He says, I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Think about the things you think about as you go to bed. Your mind racing with tomorrow, the worries of tomorrow, the anxieties of tomorrow. Maybe we're thinking back of the pain of the day, the things that happened that hurt us, the regrets we may have from choices we made. And David says, I lie awake thinking of you. He's on the run. His life is at risk. He's in the wilderness, in a barren desert. And he's lying awake, looking up at the sky, looking at the stars and thinking about God. Meditating on you through the night. God was his priority. He was the first. He says, I earnestly, I earnestly, I search for you early. I start my day seeking you, that I would see you because you are here. Uncover my blind eyes. And he ends his day with it. I'm thinking of you. I'm meditating on you. What if, I'll give you a challenge. What if for the next seven days, the first thing we did when we woke up, before news, coffee, Facebook, and the last thing we did before we shut the light off at night is we read Psalm 63. It takes about a minute. If you started reading it and you ended reading it, what could God do with that? A lot. I think he could do a lot. So I would encourage and challenge you to try it. 
to see what your day looks like if you start it seeking and searching and end it by meditating and thinking of and see what God can do. Because David understood, he said, because you are my helper, because I need you, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. David's king. Like he, he, he could have anything he wants. He could do anything he wants. But this posture he's taken, one of submission to God, he says, I'm in the shadow of your wings. And how many people do we know that live and they keep God in the shadow of their wings? That God is just a bystander. And that they, they bring him in when they need him. He's part of the team. David said, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. You're where I find my safety. I cling to you. That same phrase is in Genesis 2, 24, where he talks about a man and a woman. And they leave their mother and their father and they come together, they cleave together. There's this glue, this bond that is unbreakable where two become one. That's the same phrase for this relationship with God. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. My security is not in the things of this world or this life. It's not in the people that I'm associating with. It's not in my bank accounts or my assets. It's not in my position. It's none of it. My security is in you, God, and you alone. And he says, but those plotting to destroy me will come to ruin. They will go down into the depths of the earth. They will die by the sword and become the food of jackals. But the king will rejoice in God, speaking of himself. He's being pursued, betrayed by a son. And he says, those plotting to destroy me will come to ruin. Their plan is not gonna work out because I'm in the shadow of your wings, because I cling to you, because your right hand holds me securely, God. With God, we have victory. And we can worship in the wilderness because of it. The wilderness is temporary. Even if our life ends in the wilderness, we've seen people who are heroes of the faith that have given their life to share the good news of Jesus. And they're in glory with God right now. There's victory with God. It's inevitable. He says, the king will rejoice and all who swear to tell the truth will praise him and all the liars will be silenced. So we can cling to God and we can praise him in in the desert and we can seek him and we can surrender and we can sing to him because we know that this is temporary. And no matter how big the opposition seems to be getting and how loud their voice seems to be, he says, Victory is yours, God. You will win. The enemies will die by the sword. They will become food for jackals. Scavengers will eat their bodies. But we rejoice in you. Some people believe that when you put your faith in Christ, and you become a Christian, a follower, a disciple, whatever you want to call it, that life gets better. That because you're on the winning side now, everything gets easier. And I would argue the exact opposite. I think things get a lot harder because we have an enemy who's actively at work against us. So everything we do is in the face of an enemy who's trying to stop us. And we live in a culture that rejects us. God doesn't promise that we won't experience problems, opposition promises that we won't do it alone. That's the promise of Jesus. He told his disciples as he was leaving planet earth, he said, it's better for me to go because when I go, you will get the Holy Spirit or you'll get the presence of God in you. Right now, if you want to be near me, you physically have to be near me. You have to be where I'm at to experience this. But when I leave, each of you will have the presence of God. He will be with you wherever you are. So the promise isn't that we won't go through it. The promise is that we won't go through it alone. David understood that. He understood who God is and the blessing that we have that he would choose to love us 
and include us. And he's worthy of our praise. But the question is, do we, do we love him? Do we love God? Not know him. Not know him. The Bible tells us even, even the demons know him. Not know him in our head, but love him in our heart. It starts with knowing him. Do we know Jesus as Savior? Have we put our faith in him? Have we accepted the reality of our depravity? That we are born sinful people condemned to die, spend eternity away from God. It's humbling to be in that place. But it's where we need to be. It starts there. And then we put our faith in Christ because he's done for us what nobody else can do and we can't do for ourselves. And then he starts the process of changing us, drawing us out, making us look more like him, separating us, sanctifying us, building our faith. And I think the longer we follow him, the closer we adhere to his call. We see his plan. He's revealing it to us. We're surrendering our plan to go to his plan. We're doing it. It's uncomfortable. It's difficult. It's challenging. It won't create a lot of applause by the world. But it draws us into a deeper relationship with him that grows our love. And the closer we get to him, the more we realize we don't deserve him, which creates more of a heart of worship. And that's where David is. And that's how David can worship in the wilderness. Because he knew God's love wasn't dependent on his circumstances. It had nothing to do with where David was in the moment. God was with him. Because God loved him. David wasn't unique. The same truth is for you and I. God can be with us wherever we are. God will lead us through whatever it is. We just need to pray to seek him. And then to surrender and then when we gather like this, we sing because he's worthy of our praise. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus who's done for us, God, what we could not do for ourselves. The reality that we are helpless without you is a hard truth to accept at times, God, but it's truth. So help us to understand and embrace our need for you that you desire us because you love us, but we need you. We desperately need you. And everything we have is because of you. May we praise you because you are worthy. May we daily seek and search and then surrender to you because you are right. May we be found faithful. God, when you look down on us, May you see people who have a heart for you. That we find our satisfaction in you and in you alone because you're the only one that can. And may you use us to advance your kingdom. We love you and we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that I pray, amen.